Well, last time, let's just remind ourselves kind of where we were. Uh, we were talking about, so if we have a function, consider function f of x, y, okay? We're going to define a critical point Um, uh, a critical point is anything that makes the gradient the zero vector. Okay, so the, all that means is just that, uh, what is the gradient again? It's just a vector whose first coordinate is the partial with respect to x and whose second coordinate is the partial with respect to y. We want to know when both of those things are zero at the same time. Okay, so it's not enough for one of them to be zero and the other one to be non-zero. We want both to be zero, okay? So any such point we will call a critical point, um, which is what we called these things in Calc 1, right? Anything that made the derivative zero, we called a critical point. Okay, so we Gucci on that, yeah? Okay, so back in Calc 1, right, where did maxima and minima occur? They occurred... Right, they occurred at, at critical points, right? But how did you tell the difference between a max and a min? Yeah, Cole. Uh, other way. Right. Right, okay, so that was what we called the first derivative test, right? So you said, all right, if I've got a function whose derivative is zero at some point, and right before that point, the derivative is positive, and right after that point, the derivative is negative, then that just meant that I went through a maximum. Similarly, if you went from negative to positive, you went through a minimum, and if it didn't change sign, so if it went like positive, zero, positive, then uh, that was probably going to be an inflection point. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so that was one way we could do it. Now, that particular approach is not really going to work in the multivariable context. Because when we say first derivative, well, which one? You know, so like, what are we gonna do there? Okay, so what was the other option in Calc 1 for how you could tell whether or not you had a max or a min? You looked at the second derivative, right? Okay, and if the second derivative was positive, then that meant locally your function was concave up, which meant you went through a minimum. If it was negative, then that was a maximum. And if it was zero, well, then that's when we started to think maybe we had an inflection point, okay? Okay, so that's sort of the approach we're gonna take with the multivariable guys, is we're gonna look at the second derivatives. Now, there's one minor problem. How many second derivatives are there? Second. There's just four, right? <laughs> well, it was bound to happen eventually. Yes. Uh, kids these days. Okay, yes, there are four second derivatives. Okay, so I'm going to define the four second derivatives, and I'm going to put these things into a matrix. Um, yeah, H for Hessian. Yeah. Okay, it's a Hessian and it ain't got no aggression. You guys remember the Looney Tunes cartoons when the Bugs Bunny was like a Revolutionary War soldier and uh, uh, Yosemite Sam was the 
a Hessian Hessian soldier. Yeah. Did you guys never watch these things when you were kids? Uh. Okay, well, pop quiz then. What is by far probably the best Bugs Bunny cartoon of all time? There are se probably several contenders, but what's what it was my favorite? I said, well, yeah, well you have to. Well, I think both, right? Um, of course you do, because it's your favorite. Okay, so what's Opera Doc? Do you know this one? Killed a wabbit, killed a wabbit, killed a... It's when Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd do Wagner. Oh, it's... Yeah, okay, anyway. Um, all right, so this thing is called the Hessian Matrix, and we're going to look at this quantity, which I'll call capital Delta. Which is that, okay? Now... Um, what uh, what do I get to assume here? Functions, all functions that we'll deal with are nice. And so what's true about the the two mixed partial derivatives? The They're the same. Okay. And so I can just choose one of them. The other one's the same. So I'll just write it as that thing squared. Okay. Okay. So this thing, this quantity, um, fxx, fyy minus fxy squared, is what we need to uh, consider, okay? And uh, we'll need to consider whether or not it's positive, negative, zero, and then a few other uh, minor details. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna make sure that the... Uh, um, the stream is good. Okay. Okay, so... Um, to suss out what's going on with this thing, let's actually kind of do it in more of an exploratory manner. Okay, so for that, let's go over to Mathematica. Yeah, this is Cole's favorite favorite part. Okay. All right, now let me just define a function. Now, I think last time we were playing with... Dang it. We were playing with this function, yeah? Okay. And let's just plot it, just to remind ourselves, sine y, okay, that's fine. Six of one, half a dozen of another. Okay, so I'll plot this thing for uh, there, okay. And we've got some interesting uh, points going on, okay? Right, uh, we clearly have a maximum here. We clearly have a minimum over there. And I do not know why the graphics are being so funky. Well, you see how when I click on it and rotate, it looks different than when it's so like that? You see how it, um, yeah, I don't know why it's doing that. I'll have to, yeah, okay, anyway. But we've got a max and we've got a min. And then we also have a couple of interesting points which are sort of in this like ridge. So let me actually also do a contour plot while we're at it. Uh, so this is our topographical map, okay? So looking at the topographical map, what do we have at the, sort of in the yellow zone? There's a max there. There's a min at the, in the dark blue zone. And then there's a couple of these points where uh, it looks like a cross. So like right here, if you kind of go in one direction, it sort of looks like a max, and in another direction, it sort of looks like a min. Okay, so we'll call that thing a saddle. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, okay, so what I want to do is, well, first off, what are the coordinates of these two points that we think are maxes and mins? The x-coordinate for both of them is zero, and the y-coordinate is 
well, 1.5 something, so what's that Q for in trig language? I'll take pi over 2. Right, 1.57 would be pi over 2, okay? Um, and, you know, sit down and take the derivative and you'll get that. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to define this quantity, which I've called delta. Okay, and what I'm going to do for this is, first thing, I'm going to define The, the, I'm going to define the four second derivatives. Okay, so I've defined the four second derivatives, fxx, fxy, or sorry, fyy, and then fxy and fyx are the same thing, so I really only need one of them, okay? And then I'm going to construct this quantity delta that I define, which is going to be fxx at a point times fyy at that point minus fxy at that point squared, okay? All right, so I just defined this delta quantity. Okay, and what I want us to do is we've already found the two critical points, or we think we have, right? So here is pi halves uh, in the y direction or negative pi halves for this other one, okay? So the two points we want to consider are 0 comma pi halves and... This one, okay? So the first one, zero comma pi halves, is the suspected location of the maximum, and the other one is the suspected location of the minimum. Yes, Cole? Uh, yes, because the function I picked is sort of regular, right? It's periodic, okay? Um, and the maxes are going to be at height one, and the minimums are going to be at height minus one kind of thing, right? So. Um, because I picked trig function-y sort of stuff here, it'll work out like that, but that's just because of the function we picked. Okay, so if I if I compute that value at both points, what do I get? Get one for both of them. Now that's a bit of a problem because one of them is a max and the other one's a min, right? But yet this delta quantity gave us the same thing. Okay, so this delta quantity in and of itself is not quite enough to determine max versus min. Okay, so let me concentrate on the, the suspected maximum point. So I'm going to move this down to a new cell. And the things I want to compute... is I'm going to compute fxx and fyy, these two things are basically my second derivatives in a coordinate sense, okay? And what do I get there? They're both negative. Okay, now if we think back to Calc 1, what did negative second derivative tell you? I told you concave down, which meant max or min? Uh, max. Max, okay? All right, now what do you think if I compute fxx and fyy at the other point? Okay. Okay, so Cole guesses one. Any other guesses? Okay, the fact that it's going to be one is not so important. What is important? They're both going to be positive, okay? Uh, and so let's uh, look at that. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Okay, so what happens is that they're both positive. Okay, is that okay? 
So the delta comes out as one of like because it's like half the value. No, it's just because the the two second derivatives got multiplied. If they're the same sign, then the negatives would cancel, so to speak. Gotcha. Right. So that's just how it worked out. Okay. So what's the moral of the story here? A maximum or a minimum occurs when this delta quantity is positive and when both uh, uh, both second derivatives have, well, they're going to have the same sign, but if both pure second derivatives, and what I mean by pure is that they're xx or yy, they're not mixed, okay? Um, the pure second derivatives, if they're both positive, that means a minimum. If they're both negative, that means a maximum. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so let's write that down. Um, oh, uh, uh, that would be good. Extreme values or optimization, unconstrained optimization. Because there is constrained optimization, and if we had two more weeks, believe me, we would be doing some calculus like you wouldn't believe. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let me go back to the uh, Elgato for everybody on the stream. Uh, it's one of the Christmas movies, like... Um, Nightmare on Elm Street or something like that, right? Or, I mean, there's a scene similar to um, uh, the Santa Claus, but that's, that's not him. Okay. That's Huck. I do think oh, that. right. I do. That's been a while. Uh, I win! I win! Sorry. Yeah, but see, Cole... You beat me, Cole beat you, and every day goes by I beat Cole. <laughs> so transitively, I've just beat you. Yeah, okay. All right. What do you mean? Nabla? It's a different thing. Yeah. So this delta, I'm just using as a symbol to define that determinant. And this symbol is used for the gradient. Okay. Um, yeah. So the, the thing on the right is called Nabla, which is a Greek word for a harp of Hebrew origin. Um, so... Oh, I don't know. I looked it up. I was like, why Nabla? I'm not sure. And then I looked it up and yeah. I mean, come on, you guys should know this by now, right? I'm an information sponge and, or, or maybe better put like I'm a Borg, but for information. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you what I ate on my fourth birthday party. Yeah. Uh, clam chowder at a place called Fisherman's Wharf in Jacksonville, North Carolina. So, yeah. There's some hazy spots in there, but I remember a lot of weird details like that. Um, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, we were, at the time, my, my mom and I lived in Virginia, and my dad had been stationed in at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and we were in the process of moving. Yeah. So we were still in Virginia, finishing up selling the house and uh, packing and, and stuff like that. And my dad was already in North Carolina. So we drove down on a weekend for 
uh, for my birthday so that we could see him. And then eventually we, we actually moved. So anyway, um, okay. So, um, if both parcels, second parcels are negative, then that's where we find a local max. Okay. All right. So that part kind of works like Calc 1. But there's one other situation, well, actually two other situations that we have here. Okay, now first off, look very carefully at the quantity delta. Okay, it was defined as FXX, FYY minus FXY squared. If FXX and FYY are of opposite signs than each other, then what is guaranteed to happen with the quantity delta? No, just like numerically, what, what is guaranteed? It's going to be negative, right? Because we have a negative first term. And the second thing is we're subtracting something, right? So that's going to be negative, no matter what, okay? And that situation is what we'll call a saddle point. We'll look at an example of that in a minute. And the last situation would be if just by dumb luck, this stuff happens to come out to be zero, then what, uh, you guys should be used to this sort of thing happening by now. It's inconclusive. Yeah, well, the mysteries of calculus are deep. So it's inconclusive like on the graph, if they, if they graph it, is it gonna say error? Is it no, it's like the test is inconclusive. But if we have a graph, we might be able to say something better. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So let's go back. Let me change my, uh, let me, let's go back to Mathematica. Okay. And I'm going to go up here and I'm going to change my surface to something else. Just for the sake of demonstration. Okay. So I'm going to change it to X squared minus Y squared. This is uh, the Pringle surface. Yeah, okay. All right, here's the contour plot for it. So if we look at the contour plot, in the horizontal direction, it looks like it's a local min. Okay, so meaning that if I'm at negative three comma zero, that'd be here. If I start here and I walk east, what happens? I go down and then I come back up, okay? Whereas if I started down here at uh, zero comma negative three, and I walked north, then I would go up, then I would go down, right? So in one direction, the east-west direction, this point in the middle looks like it's a local maximum. But in the north-south direction, it looks like it's a local minimum, okay? So what would you expect FXX to be? based on just looking at this. Positive or negative? Uh, I would expect, well, okay, which one? FXX or FYY? XX will be positive. Because in the X direction, what happens? We go down and then we come back up. That's concave up. Yes. Okay. It is the concavity, right, in a coordinate sense. So in this direction, we're concave up because we go down and then we come back up. In the north-south direction, which would be FYY, holding X constant, we go up and then come down, right? That's concave down. All right, so here I would expect that at that point, FXX is positive and FYY is negative. And if they're of opposite signs, what's going to happen to the quantity delta? It'll be negative, right? Okay, so 
let's uh, let's just double check that. First off, where is our critical point here? In this case, it's at the origin. So what I need to do is these computations here. Uh, well, we know it's going to be a saddle point, but we're just sort of checking to make sure that it is. Okay. And sure enough, that's what we get. So uh, negative 4 is the quantity delta, and negative 2 and 2 are fxx and fyy, respectively. Now, does it make sense that that's what they ought to be? What's the second derivative? What is fxx in this case, like uh, as a function, not numerically? Well, what was the function? x squared minus y squared? What's the derivative of that? 2. two. Right? And then the other one would be minus 2. So they happen to be constant functions. And Will, I just noticed your socks, and those are freaking awesome. Yeah. He's got quadratic formula socks going on. Right? Yeah. That's 4 thirds pi r cubed. Yeah. Good. Okay. Some, uh, e equals mc squared. That's... Yeah. <laughs> hey, if you decide to get a tattoo of calculus, like mad respects, you can keep it. No, because I'll come with like a sponge and a bucket of soapy water, right? And I'll try and. Okay, Hannah. Yeah, Hannah. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, okay. So, right. So, um, yeah, but how do you know that, like, just by dumb luck, you're not going to get zero at a point, right? Now, in this case, because I chose a surface that was, like I knew this, it, how it was going to work out in advance, that didn't happen, right? But there's no guarantee that fxx and fyy, like that quantity could come out to be zero somehow, okay. right? And since we don't know that a priori, we have to go through and check. Yes? Uh, actually, yeah, the monkey saddle would be a good example. Let me remind myself what that equation is real quick because I always forget it. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, okay, so anyway, you guys get why we call this a saddle point then, because this surface, uh, this is an example, looks kind of like a horse saddle, right? It's a local min in the front back direction, and it's a local max in the left right direction, and then the 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 descending parts on either side would be where your legs would go on a horse. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, and uh, here's a, I think I showed you guys this last time. We have, so there was a uh, German company way back in the day, Brill. And I think, uh, I think there's, there's roots of it like, in the Brill Publishing Company, like I think that they're related in some way, that would uh, you could buy models of various geometric things for teaching purposes. Because in the 1950s, we did not have Mathematica, right? So we had to build these things, right? And so we've got one of these, this hyperbolic paraboloid, and um, actually the label of it is in German, right? Hyper Hyperbolicious paraboloid, Verlag, L. Brill, three serial number fourteen. Yeah, it does. Well, I mean, but like back in the fifties, if I were teaching this stuff, I would have to resort to passing this around so you guys could kind of get the idea, right? So, um, yeah, here we are. We've got Mathematica nowadays. Uh, okay. So anyway, uh, make sense. All right, so let's look at a different surface. Oops. 
There we go. Okay, so this thing is called the monkey saddle. So the idea here is this little dip at the back is where the monkey's tail would go. And then this dip on the sides are where the monkey's legs would go. And then it would rise up, you know, in front of him. And that's where he would be able to grab onto, right? The, what's that part called on a, on a saddle? It's right at the front part where you could, you could, you guys know what I'm talking about though. Yeah. Okay. How many of you have ever actually ridden a horse, by the way? You think so? <laughs> it seems like something you ought to remember. Well, that's possible, right? Okay. So, eh, anyway. Um, I wish I actually knew more about equestrianship. Because what I think it'd be really cool to do a tutorial on horsemanship. A horn. That's it. Okay. Uh, do a freshman tutorial on horsemanship. Well, that would be another one too, right? The underwater basket weaving one. Basket weaving. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. All right. So that's the idea, right? Is that it sort of looks like, you know, if we were monkeys or if we had tails, we would need a place to put our tail on our saddle to be comfortable and this sort of thing yeah, looks reasonable. Okay, so here's the contour plot, right? So what you can see is that the, uh, the tail would go back this way and the two legs would go that way and looks like a perfectly comfortable saddle if you're a monkey and you want to ride a horse, right? Okay, so what we want to do is, well, first off, does it seem like that point in the middle is probably a critical point? Okay, let's double check that it is. Second, if it is, we want to classify it. Is it a max? Is it a min? Is it a saddle? Or is it, we're not sure. All right, so the first thing I need to do is I just need to double check. Um, let me actually delete this, and I'm going to put a... Uh, I'm going to split the cell here, and I'm going to compute fx, which I never actually defined, did I? So let's first define that. All right, so first derivative with respect to each coordinate. Okay, and then I want to compute fx at 0, 0, and fy at 0, 0, because I think that I've got a critical point there, and I just need to make sure I do, and sure enough, I do. Okay, so what again, what does it mean to be a critical point? It's not enough to make one of those derivatives 0. You have to make both of them 0 at the same place. Okay, okay so this is a point where my gradient is 0. Okay, so we know we have a critical point, and then we go to this, this Hessian thing to try to classify what kind of critical point it is. Okay, so what do we get for the quantity delta? We get zero. Okay, and it turns out in this particular example that both of the pure second parcels are also zero. Okay. So, what is this critical point according to our test? It's not a saddle point, and it's not a max or a min either. It's inconclusive. Okay, so this is an example of where the test fails and where you have something that's sort of a saddle point, but not really. Okay. Okay, so... Uh, so in general, then, what do we want to do for a given problem like this? Well, the first thing you have to do, so let's think about this like we did in Calc 1. In Calc 1, how did you find all your optimum points? You had to take the derivative, you had to set it equal to zero, and solve. That found you all of your critical points. Once you have critical points, then you classified them by using the first or second derivative test. Okay as either being maxes, mins, or 
not maxes or mins. They'd be points of inflection usually. Okay, good. Same thing here. Step one is find when the gradient is zero. Okay, so that tells you all your critical points. And there could be just one of them. There could be a lot of them. Okay, that just depends on the function. Uh, step two, for each critical point, classify it by using this delta trick. Okay, now, one thing I have to make sure that I'm clear on is when I say this delta trick, notice that this delta trick or this delta thing still depends on x and y. So you have to plug in the specific coordinates of your critical point to it. The value of delta could be different at one point than from another. And that basically quite often will happen, okay? So it's not that delta is always a constant, even though in two of the examples we worked out today, it just so happened to be constant. Okay, is that is that okay? Yeah. Um, and then otherwise, right, it's almost just like Calc 1, but with more letters. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay, so delta positive by itself doesn't tell you anything. Okay, delta positive tells you it might be a max or it might be a min. But what do you have to check? Yeah, the two concavities. Okay. Um, right, and they have to both be of the same sign. Okay, uh, either both plus or both minus. Um, if it's the delta quantity is negative, then you have a saddle point, and if it's zero, then it's inconclusive. Okay, so does that kind of make sense? Now, as a preview of coming attractions, um, how many of you guys are going to go on to linear algebra and then maybe eventually math 225, which is multivariable calculus, maybe, okay? So this quantity delta is the determinant in a matrix sense. Um, and it turns out that that in, like, let's say that we wanted to generalize this to three or four or five or however many variables. This rule actually gets a lot more complicated, okay? And um, uh, you, to do it properly, so for two variables, it works out simple enough to just be this. But if it's in three or more variables, you really need the language of linear algebra to do this because um, what we're actually looking at are what are called eigenvalues of the Hessian matrix. And linear algebra is where you'll learn what eigenvalues mean, and then in multivariable, you'll be able to then say, okay, I know what these things are. I have a matrix. I can calculate them. What do they tell me? Okay. In the two-variable case, it works out simple enough that, um, that we can just state it. And that's really not that bad of a statement. It's a lot more complicated for three or more variables. Okay. Um, and so, you know, if you want to explore further the mysteries of multivariable calculus, then I invite you to take Math 225. Okay. All right. And then there's some other people like Cole who are like, yeah, no, I'm good. That, that you don't want to take Math 225, that you're, that you're not cool. <laughs> it's all right. Okay. Are you limiting his potential? No. Well, because I got two of them this semester, that's enough for a whole year, right? So anyway, uh, okay. So uh, yeah, that's basically it. Um, I wish we had more uh, more time to do more cool stuff, but alas, um, it's been a fun semester. I think. What do you guys think? Yeet. Yeet. Yeah, and aren't you glad? So, um, okay. So, uh, right. So then that leaves the last couple of pieces of business to talk about um, tasks and infinities and 
Uh, any last retakes on fluency assessments? Right? Okay, need to happen quickly um, because the semester is, is dwindling. When is our final? Yes. When is our final? Next Monday. Monday? Is it? Let's double check. Yeah, no, let's double check. Huh? I don't remember off the top of my head. Yes, okay. So when does our class meet? We meet at 9.05. Therefore, our final is Monday, November 23rd, 1330 to 1630 in this room. Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay. Uh, the other guys that are in the afternoon section with Dr. Insaldi, their final is at night, which kind of blows, but. Um, what do you mean, kind of blows? Not really. Oh, well, okay. It really blows. Uh, a bang? Oh. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Not that he's going to do a line of Coke no, no, <laughs> or something. Right. Okay. Uh, he'll just drink a Coke. Right. Okay. So, right. So, Monday, November 23rd. This, by the way, is the final exam schedule. This is schwabash.edu slash registrar. The entire schedule for all of your classes. Okay. That's why I loaded this thing. Um, so, yeah. Now. Uh, some of your classes, for example, your freshman tutorial, you may not actually have an exam, but rather a final paper. Um, and if that's the case, then obviously you don't have to go anywhere. But uh, but there's the schedule. Okay. Um, so like um, uh, Mr. Kim was asking earlier, you have three hours for it. I'm going to estimate and uh, Dr. Insaldi are, and I are still in the process of writing this thing, but I don't think it will, we're not gonna design it to require all three hours, okay? Um, and so like when I write these things, I try to keep them to about a two hour exam, even though you have three hours, okay? So I don't want time to be the problem, basically. Uh, nope, just uh, writing implements, that's all you'll need. No, no calculators, um, just you and your brain. And yeah, if you want to bring a, a teddy bear, that's fine too. You are my teddy bear. Aww. Okay. Um, okay, so, right. Um, otherwise, I think that's all the business. Um, if there's any further updates on things, we'll... Uh, send out information on canvas um so uh yeah any final questions jack uh for infinity uh well no obviously we'll change that but uh you know i don't remember because the last day for retakes and tasks is basically wednesday right we want to get that done uh get retakes and tasks uh, that ship sails on when, uh, after Wednesday because then you need to be worrying about the final. The Edfinity, well, particularly with this multivariable stuff, um, I mean, for exams on Monday, it would be probably okay to, I guess Monday, right? You kind of have to finish Edfinities before the exam. So, and it doesn't do you a whole lot of good to do Edfinities after the exam. So, anyway, um, yeah. No, I will not hand out the exams until 4.30. Oh, sorry. You tricked me. I will not hand out the exams until 1.30. Yes, please do not show up late. In fact, please show up early. Um, the fact that it's at 1.30 in the afternoon means that nobody ought to be oversleeping it. Though you guys really haven't had that problem this semester. Um especially those of you who have 8 a.m. classes right before this with moi. Um, so, yeah. Um, all right. Well, that's basically it. So any further updates will be on uh, sent out through Canvas. And um, it's been fun, guys. So uh, see you guys later. <laughs>